Hello folks and welcome to the Kim Justice Christmas Special. Now it's kind of funny because in five years that I've been doing this channel I've never done anything seasonal. No Easter vid, no Halloween vid, no summer solstice vid and certainly no Christmas vid. But today that's about to change as finally I've got a Christmas video lined up for all y'all. I've even gone and spared no expense on all the surroundings here, you know. These lights cost a pretty penny. We've got a uh, reindeer here. Um, there's a tree somewhere over there as well. You can barely see it, but it is around. Anyway, it's time for the Kim Justice Christmas special and I'm pretty damn happy about that. Let's take a look at what's coming up. Over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, you can expect the following. It wouldn't be Christmas without some classic bloopers, and I've picked out several favourites. It wouldn't be a Kim Justice video without some sort of gratuitous error after all. I'll also be doing a couple of mini reviews for some weird and wonderful Christmas games. And of course, the main event. What were your top 10 Kim Justice videos of the year? <laughs> it's going to be a doozy, I can assure you. In fact, why don't we just get on with the first few entries right now. Kicking off at number 10, we have PlayStation Football. I'm quite happy that this made it, as I didn't expect it to. I always thought that old footy games would be about as popular a subject on YouTube as, I don't know, old Department of Agriculture meetings from the 1970s. But I was wrong. It got a great response, and it sneaks into the top 10 with 16 votes. We covered all sorts of classics from the era. Free Lions, Viva Football, All-Star Soccer, Onside Soccer, <laughs> only the best. Let's have a look. Welcome to Michael Owen's World League Soccer 99. Have fun. What? Oh, headed too close to the goalkeeper. Stan, a brilliant save! I don't like football games, but this video is interesting on the level I sold so many copies of these when I worked at Electronics Boutique, just to see them traded it back in for pennies when FIFA came out. Poor Galgo. It's a scissor! This was my video of the year. Just so many games and memories. Saturday afternoons, Barry Davis on the mic, Legends like Backham spraying passes around, ocean colour scene blaring. Happy days. Scorchio! It's off the woodwork! It's a keeper's ball. I had no idea there were that many terrible football games. I don't know if other footballs. International, international superstar, soccer pro. I had a video where Kim explained it was what was good and what was bad. Thank you, Kim! And he scored! There's only one full minute of normal time to go. After that, it's down to the... There's only, there's only one full... It was 1998 and we were drawing one apiece against Manchester United. Uh, bought them all teams. Then suddenly... Scored! That striker, I forget his name now, I forget his name. Ginger guy, not me. 30 yard strike. Ball went in from 30 yards. Scored, yo! Scored, yo! You know, one of them. Um, then my brother uh, threw, threw the controller right at me, come flying in here, this side. Uh, see the ball, it just went straight through the keeper's legs. Easy save. Um, in fact, I've still got the scar right on the side of my nose. Yeah. And in number nine, it's... The last stand of Jack Trammell makes it into the list with 21 votes. The conclusion to the Trammell saga covering his time at Atari and War with Amiga. I loved making this. It was a good end to the time spent with Jack and also a way to sort out some things, a bit of an expansion on the old rise and fall of the Amiga video. It was always fun to read about the exploits of Jack. I almost ended up rooting for him whenever there were reports of another vicious Jack attack. Definitely one of the most interesting people I've ever covered. A lovable overlord. Jack Trammell. Jack Trammell. Now there is a guy who would make a perfect politician in the sense of politicians at the moment because he just loves starting wars. He thinks he's in a war all the time. He runs everything like he's in a war. It'd be perfect. He could bomb whichever country he wanted. Have a whale of a time. The thing is about Jack Trammell, I heard that nobody actually ever caught the full power of one of his bollockings. I heard that once he gathered up every single member of Atari into one room and in the space of an hour, he jack attacked every single one of them. 
It would have been like walking into a bloody wood chipper. None of them would have stood a chance. I heard the cleaners were cleaning up for a good month. What a man. Yeah. And for number eight, we have the story of US Gold. 23 votes was enough to see the story of Jeff Brown, his company and his music career hit the top 10. This was one hell of a video, lots of research and lots of games. I never even bothered counting how many US Gold games I played for this video, but I know that it was a lot, and I also know that I'll probably never be quite the same again because of that. I think once I'd hit World Cup USA 94, I was almost on the breaking point. But we made it through, and we delivered the bomb. Another smash and, in the end, a pretty cool company. By the way, did you pick out a young DJ Slope nestled in the video? If you didn't, here he is again, performing Lux as a part of the human guinea pigs in the early 2000s. Thanks to him for being a jolly good sport about it. Although I can't take credit for the idea. I have fond memories of US Gold and the software they imported before they turned into the licensing machine. Beachhead, Radio of Moscow, Taladega? Played that lot for some reason. I couldn't help but feel a little bit told off when I watched Kim's take on US Gold, because I've been bad mouthing them for years, but as Kim's video demonstrates, they really weren't all that bad. Their ports of Street Fighter 2 were still horrible though, sorry. This was a great video, but Kim got one thing very wrong. World Cup Carnival is actually the greatest football game ever. No, seriously, right? At its heart, football is simply about running forward in a straight line and shooting a ball directly in the middle of the goal. And the game captured that perfectly by giving you absolutely no other option except to do that. Oh, what a title. But one day, you will see it. You'll see. Well, yeah, I mean, it's only sometimes that I get things wrong, you know, occasionally, uh, repeatedly, uh, often. Yeah, you know, as I always say, it wouldn't be a Kim Justice video without some kind of foul up. And what I've done for this special is I've gone through the archives and um, picked out a couple of my favourites for you to look at. Let's go. Here's one from way back, Super Mario 2 1998. Oh, and hey, here's the deadliest enemy in the game, the jellyfish. One false move, and they'll have at you with all the precision and speed of a laser-guided missile. Naturally, there's been no end of people ready to point out that this supposed jellyfish is, of course, known as the blooper, for that is its name. More pertinently, they've also pointed out that this is not a jellyfish at all, it's a bloody squid. On a similar note, here's one from Golden Axe. And to be honest, I quite like the new characters too. I quite like playing as the lizard, he's really fast, he's got tons of moves that can wall jump. I mean, the I have guys. no idea why this thing that's quite clearly a panther was referred to as a lizard. Something just came over me. It was a total adlib in fact. Adlibs are dangerous and cause complete foul ups. Much better to read a script off a TV screen, just like I'm doing now. There are of course plenty of omissions over the years that folks have picked up on. Where was The Simpsons Road Rage in The Simpsons Top 10? Surely that was better than, I don't know, Bart's House of Weirdness. Where was WWE Day of Reckoning? Or Star Trek A Final Unity? Or Lord knows how many other games that in all probability deserved to be included somewhere. Sometimes you just forget. In a lot of those cases though, it was impossible to capture stuff. A lot of them occurred early on. I'll rectify them at some point. Still one foul up stands above everything else. The video is Games Master, and I said this when referring to the Games Master himself, the late Sir Patrick Moore. The most famous name associated with the show was the Games Master himself, astrologer Patrick Moore. And considering that he'd spent over 50 years hosting the Sky at Night, this was not exactly his usual audience. People have been screaming ever since. Sir Patrick was, of course, an astronomer, not an astrologer. This is an astrologer. Placing Sir Patrick in the company of Mystic Meg was pretty silly, but just once? You could call it a slip of the tongue. But then, later on, in the same video, many tributes were paid to him by all the scientists and astrologists in the land, but there was another generation who paid tribute for a wholly different reason. What can I say? I'm sorry. I have no idea why I wrote astrologer instead of astronomer and then failed to pick up on it. It happens. Just, yeah. One of the many laughs in Kim Justice videos over the years. 
Whether it's getting someone's profession one, or neglecting to mention anything on the Amstrad or PC, I'm always bound to annoy someone. Now I thought it quite possible that around this time you would be looking for something to play that might perhaps get you in the mood for the season. Although it has to be said that these days, the season starts around about November 1st when all the Halloween stuff gets put in the bin. It's quite possible that by this time you're absolutely sick of the word Christmas and you can't wait for all this shit to be over. But, just in case you aren't, here's the first of my special Christmas reviews. It's the official Father Christmas game for the ZX Spectrum. Whoa, VT! So, the official Father Christmas game. I'm not sure exactly what makes this game official, but hey ho. This is a budget game by Alternative Software, and it came out for the Specky, Amstrad and C64 in 1989. You have a simple enough quest. It's Christmas Eve, and you've got to deliver all those damn presents to the little SOBs down there. But first you need to assemble your sleigh. The parts are all dotted around your little cottage. This is harder than you think, as you've also got to avoid the elves who'll get in your way and nick the sleigh parts off you if you touch them. God only knows why Santa employs these assholes. If I were him I'd have shoved them in the back of my sleigh and dumped them somewhere in the Pacific, but eh, there you are. Up next you have to then grab presents that you select from a menu. Now this is a neat little touch. You enter your name in the beginning, and then for this level you construct a little letter to Santa with the presents you want, and then those are the presents you have to collect as they randomly fall down. The third and final part is, of course, delivery. This can also be a little annoying as you fly around for ages looking for the little arrow, and then try and drop the present through the clouds and out of control planes, but once you find one, the next isn't far away. You deliver six presents each to America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. <laughs> Yeah, um, clearly the world's in the grip of a big recession as Santa's sleigh is quite empty this year. And he also hates Australians because they're getting sweet Fanny Adam. South America? Screw you too. Middle East? <laughs> Screw you too. Santa wants to get home in time for in bed with me dinner, so he's not messing around. And, um, that's it. Once you deliver the presents, the game's done. It's over and out in around about 15 minutes, and it's almost impossible not to beat the game first try. But then this is a budget game, priced at a mere three quid, meaning that it would be perfect stocking filler. Alternative were pretty savvy here, I suppose. Bun lists on the shelves, tons of people buy it as a random present for their kids, and there you are. Played once, never touched again. Hey ho ho ho. For what it is, it's not bad at all, to be honest. Not much game to it, but what do you expect? And it was all for charity. The profit made for this game went to the Save the Children Fund, so it's not exactly worthy of much scorn. A good little way of raising cash. Only other weird thing is that there was only ever one review of it, a rather negative one by Your Sinclair in May of 1993. For seemingly no reason other than filling what was by then an already tiny magazine because there weren't much in the way of new games to speak of. Oh well, you know that your magazine's approaching the end times when you're resorting to slagging off an nearly four-year-old charity game. Okay, back to the top ten. We've already seen some good old footy games, glorious computer emperors, and some quite ridiculous 70s haircuts. But just what's going to be next, eh? Drinks all round. In at number 7, it's... The real Sir Clive Sinclair gets into the list with 25 votes. It was something that almost had to be done, a documentary on the man behind the computer that just gets so much time here. And it was the real deal, although an amusing title really. It's going to go and punish in detail, getting behind the image of Uncle Clive to show just who he really was. Which in the end was someone with plenty of ideas, some of them occasionally very rubbish, but otherwise a generally decent person. Who'd have thought? But finally, the C5 and the Black Watch did get their time in the sun. And for that alone, the video was fun. One of my favourites was actually, it wasn't about computer games, it was about um, that bloke from Pointless, Alexander Armstrong. Um, um, that was mate, a good one. Clive, didn't Clive, quite make Clive sense. Clive Sinclair, cause... mate. What? Clive just dri dri dripped clips from that, from that, not Alexander Armstrong. Oh. Ah, microcomputers. My great grandfather was still alive in those days, you know. Sadly, he developed cancer at just 23 years of age. Some say he was the most evil scientist of all time. Can you do one about Alexander Armstrong, please? Yeah, and that little fella looks like me. 
who's on his pointless. He's very tall. Oh, he's got glasses. One of my fondest memories from childhood was when me and my mates pulled all our pocket money together and we got a Sinclair C5. We had so much fun taking it on the road, adults gawping at us. I think they'd be a little bit annoyed because we were all on it at the same time and, you know, it used to crawl along at about a quarter of an inch per hour. What can you do? I seem to remember one of us chucked it down a hill a few years later. What a goddamn waste that was. <laughs> I wonder if anyone ever found it. Mm. I never settle for anything less. What's the next video then? Well, then at number six, it's... Hey, you. NASA, give me the Cyber Razor Cut. A cyber Razor Cut. The Sega vs Nintendo War, scoring 27 votes. Sega vs Nintendo is a pretty familiar subject, but still, lots of people didn't really know about the general state of play over here, and it was very much worth making. And again, so many games, just so many. More than almost any other video in this list, possibly. And again, it was worth it. Even after a month where I'd already done three big videos, the thought of telling the British story of Sega just kept pushing me on. Almost patriotic, really. We like to think of Sega in the end as our own. Even if, you know, they aren't. Eh, whatever. I've always been a Sega guy. I, I grew up in the UK. Nintendo wasn't a thing. Uh, I think it was incredible how Kim managed to take a global thing, but relate it very, very brilliantly to Europe. And as everybody knows, but sometimes Kim doesn't, obviously, the SNES was better. No. Yeah, that was. When Kim did the Sega vs Nintendo video, from a European, kind of UK perspective, um, I felt a tear form in my eye. Afterwards, I got up, I sang the national anthem. I had maybe 20 to 30 Yorkshire puddings. Uh, scoffed them all down, you know, right, right then and there. Um, I wonder who else felt the same. Major arms better. It was better. No, mine was, mine was better. No, fuck off. Fuck you! Fuck you! No, no, Wait! Who knows? Um, maybe what happened on June the 23rd was, was Kim's fault. Cream with Quattro. Up next, we have the first entry in the top five. With 28 votes, the Cover Tape Wars video broke a very big tie for fifth and took a place in the top five outright. It was the last video to be eligible for the vote, and it smashed its way in. Honestly, without joking, it's one of my favourites, something that covered the Speccy's late period as opposed to just its glory days, the time when I knew the Spectrum, the Amstrad years. And it was good to give airtime to some very obscure games as well. So on the whole, I'm happy that the video's done as well as it has done. Really good, guys. Thank you. The Commentator Wars video really was one of my favourites of the year, because Again, way before my generation, but I grew up with demo discs all the time. I think some of my happiest memories were getting a magazine with a cover tape or a cover disc, bringing it home and just loading it up. And I love this video because it just reminds me of that nostalgia, that moment in time. Good work, Kim. Love it. Oh, cover tapes. Good Lord. Oh man, who could forget whistling Rick Wilson? <laughs> Hold my hand very tightly, very tightly, very tightly. Hold my hand very tightly, very tightly, very tightly. Hold my hand very tightly, oh. Hold my hand very tightly, oh. Hold my hand and snuggle up next to me, cause sugar honey, I love you. When I met you on a rainy Tuesday, invited you round for some tea. How could you put me? In this position, I really miss my Intellivision. What? What do you mean I'm doing the wrong bloody song? Oh, my friend loved that song so much. He wanted Rick Wilson to sing it at his wedding, seriously. And I remember his disappointment when we had to tell him that Whistling Rick wasn't actually real. You know, I've never seen him cry twice, and that was the first time. The second time was a year later, when I accidentally told them that Father Christmas didn't exist. It was a bad year. Now as we reach the business end of the top five, I think it's time to um, just pull out for a little bit, just take a break. 
In fact, speaking of taking a break, that little squiggle over there has been going for a good nearly a minute now. And you know what that squiggle means? It means it's time to take an actual ad break. So, you know, settle down, make a cup of tea, and I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Later. He will be surprised when he sees you. Eric! Just look who's here. Yes? Trevor Brooking! Who? Trevor Brooking. How are you going? I see you play Atari. Now and then, Mr. Bookham? Brooking. Oh. Do you fancy a game of Pelly's soccer? No, he's not interested in it. I'll have a go. Let's see. Oh, forty love. He's a bit good, you're Mr. Putin. I've told you, it's Brooking. Brooking. Well, whatever his name is. Ever thought of playing Pollutant Town Reserves, youngster? No. Atari. Simply more fun and games. There's a sensational range of gifts at Curry's now. A massive choice at unbeatable prices. Personal stereo at Curry's starts at an incredible $9.99. A Philips main shaver at a gift of a price, just $19.99. An exclusive Braun food processor deal with citrus juices and free blender. And the new Sinclair Spectrum Plus 2 with free joystick and software. Curry's. No one beats our prices. Guaranteed. Now we come to the main... In the competitive world of home computers, the Commodore 64 is absolutely unbeatable. With its enormous 64K memory, its printers, plotter, disk drive, monitor, and its vast range of software, we believe the only thing the Commodore 64 doesn't have is any serious competition. The Commodore 64. Never forget it's the world's biggest selling home computer. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Now I do hope that you've all been behaving yourself during the ad break, and I do hope you enjoyed our nice selection of old school adverts. In fact, um, let me tell you what, if you decided to skip all the way to the end of the ad break just so you could get back to me, you can just go right back to the start of the ad break and watch it just like you would have to back in the days when you had no other choice to. Okay? Good. Get in the mood here, why don't you? Anyway, before anything else, I have the second of my special Christmas reviews, and we're going all 16-bit this time with the Days Before Christmas on the Sega Mega Drive. Roll it! The Days Before Christmas is an odd one. While there's a European SNES version, it only came out for the Mega Drive in Australia. It's by Norwegian devs Funcom, the same guys who did Nightmare Circus, and The Longest Journey, and curiously, it's the last game that Sunsoft released before they went bust in North America and underwent major reconstruction. As such, this seasonal release costs a pretty penny. It's very rare, and if you even see it at auction, it'll cost you a couple of hundred quid. Even the more available SNES version is pretty expensive for what it is. So, you know, just thank heaven for flashcards. Obviously this game isn't worth that kind of money because it's brilliant, but it's not a bad 16-bit platformer. You play as Santa, and you have to save Christmas from an evil snowman who's stealing presents and making toys nasty. Santa has the power of magic to hand, but he also has the ability to switch to anti-Santa. This particular bad Santa is invincible and can whack enemies with his bag of toys, but he can't collect presents. And there's lots of prezzies to collect before we're done here. That's what it's all about, collecting prezzies and then chucking them down chimneys in between levels. Kinda like the official Father Christmas game as it happens. 
This game is, I would say, a very typical late 16-bit platformer. You get a lot of decent graphics for the time, a very digitised sort of look that was in for the time even without its contemporary Donkey Kong Country, but as a platformer it kind of lacks the inventiveness of earlier 16-bit titles. The levels all feel very straightforward and without much to find anywhere. Of course, this is Sunsoft we're talking about. Having been one of the best 8-bit studios around, they fell hard in the 16-bit era, perhaps more than any other. Compared to some of their other 16-bit games, this is actually pretty damn good. Is it a good seasonal game, mind you? Well, yes. It's probably one of the most involved Santa-based games. A full set of levels, bosses, sub-games and the like, and a good standard of production values. A decent amount of work clearly went into it. Now because there's never quite been a tradition of Santa based games, it kind of feels strange to expect such effort for a game with such a short window to sell in, but that doesn't really make sense. Also while Santa films seem to lack a little of the commercial value they had before, they sure as hell didn't in 1994, this was one of the biggest movies of the year. The timing was utterly right for this game, and I can only imagine that company problems was what ended up doing it in and scotched any hope of a bigger release. If it had gotten that, it would have done pretty well. As it is, it's an obscurity, but it is amongst the more polished Christmas releases around. Right, okay, let's get back to the top ten. Our next entry is the only person to have two, two entries on the list. Who do you think it is? Are you ready to get Jack attacked some more? It's... This was how the Jack Trammell saga started, with Jack Attack, the two-part series covering his time at Commodore. 35 votes was enough to secure Trammell a deserved place in the top five. Now ever since I started doing these documentaries, Jack's always been in and around them, either as a subject or as a shorthand representing those people who are, well, somewhat driven. I didn't know if I was going to love or hate Jack by the time I was finished doing videos on him. But in the end I settled on liking him a fair bit, mainly thanks to some of the other people around him. The real villain was always Irving Gould, and I do hope that came across. Now stare into those piercing eyes some more, why don't you? You see, as a professional film critic, the thing that Kim does about Jack Trammell is really dives into the psyche of an of a incredibly difficult man. Um, she is two low-rent computer geniuses, as Joshua Oppenheimer is to the Indonesian massacres of the 1960s. I don't get that at all. Act of killing, mate. Now, you see, no one truly knows what happened between Tramiel and Irving Gould at that Winter CES show. There was once a bloke I met in a pub, though, who told me the fight was actually over what Jack had gotten for Christmas just gone. See, Jack had got him, like, you know, a soap on a rope or something like that, as you do. Uh, but Irvin had been dropping these hints for months and months that what he actually wanted was a gold encrusted shit in a cardboard box. And then he was so disappointed with Jack, essentially just fired him there and then on the spot. I don't know who that bloke was, but I did see him vomiting all over the fruit machine at closing time. <laughs> We're in the top three! And up first is the story of Ocean Software, scoring 38 votes, just enough to pip Tramiel. This was in many ways my first big games company documentary. It served as a template for every other one that followed on from it, taking in all the games as well as the company's history and the characters involved, most of whom, as they often were, were perfectly okay individuals. Why Ocean, though? Well, it's a company that a lot of folks from those days have a big connection to because they were so ubiquitous. They may not have the best reputation, but damn, some of those games were great. This video really set the ball rolling on my 2016 too, a massive hit. It made a lot of other things possible, so yeah, good choice. In any video that Kim does, it's a brilliant look at what was going on in days that we don't hear about anymore, and the things that she uses to illustrate it are hilarious and genius and insightful and quite frankly there is no better retro gaming discussion on YouTube. Absolutely. And I'm a film critic so I say that. When it came to Ocean Software you're always spoiled for choice when it came to talent. I mean I'll never forget the games with Jonathan Joppa Smith. I played Green Beret in my pants for a week on the ZX Spectrum. I only passed the first level twice, 
until I beat it. And then I got up and walked out of the house. I was blinded by light. I thought everybody, it was the glow from everybody who was in awe of what I had done. But then I realized I was just still in my pants. But what do you give the man who already has a Polaroid 1000? And in the one up spot, is the story and games of Psygnosis, scoring a fantastic 60 votes. The longest single video to date, almost feature length at around 75 minutes. It was a big effort, and even then 75 minutes wasn't enough to cover every single thing that this almighty company did. But geez, what a response. The people loved it, and some of those people even included the likes of Bill Pullen of Bill's Tomato Game fame, Tim White, and Ian Heverington himself. Gotta say, that was a pretty proud moment. People requested this video for the longest time, and it was a great feeling to finally deliver it. Once I saw this kid a few years back wearing the t-shirt you get with Shadow the Beast in the, in the big box, he must have been 10 or 11, thought to myself, you went there, you don't know what that means. Psychnosis was so consistent that I sort of took them for granted. It was like a company I grew up with, from Blood Money on the Amiga, then Lemmings of course, and then things like Destruction Derby, that had massive commercial successes without compromising their originality, which is something we should applaud. One of the biggest problems about Psygnosis was how to pronounce their names. Guaranteed, any time that the subject got brought up, you'd have people say Persignosis or Pugnosis or Psygnosis. Guaranteed, it would always get brought up and it would always start a massive argument. Uh, but one thing no one ever said was Pissignosis though, did they? Yeah, that would have uh, been a bit stupid. They wouldn't have dared do that. Nah, bloody people. Well, we're almost there then, just one more entry to go. But before that, we do still have one more Christmas themed video game to review. Now, the thing is with Christmas games is that they're kind of thin on the ground and it's very hard to find something that Retro YouTube hasn't already done to death. But I looked long and I looked hard and I actually found a game that seemed quite interesting and that I hadn't actually heard of at all before I started doing the prep for this fit. It's Santa Claus Saves the Earth for the PlayStation 1. What's it all about? Let's have a look at it, shall we? This is a mysterious game indeed, one for which I can find very little info. Apparently published by Telegames, a rather long-lived but obscure publisher, and the first game by a very minor Lithuanian developer called Evil Gamus, Santa Claus Saves the Earth came out for the PS1 very late, in fact as late as 2002, by which time there was little going on except budget titles, which is what this game is, and FIFA. The game was only released in Europe, and there's also a GBA version which, as far as I can tell, only came out in Eastern Europe. Aside from that, nothing. I've half a mind to think that the whole thing's a conspiracy, that a shady Illuminati of YouTube shit game reviewers made the game and pretended like it was from 2002 so that it could be covered by them. Cause you know, like I said, old Christmas games are pretty thin on the ground. I'm on to you, Cadicorous. The plot is as follows. There's some evil wizard who's angry that kids are celebrating Christmas and all that, so she's trapped Santa and the kids aren't going to get their presents and uh, look, it's the exact same thing as Days Before Christmas. And that kind of disappointed me actually. The title made me hope for some completely wacko Santa Claus Conquers the Martians type thing. But alas, it's the same as always. I guess that the Saves the Earth bit is because if all the kids didn't get their presents, they would rise up, take over world governments and trigger a nuclear war over some fight on Twitter. Oh, hmm, uh, maybe this game's a bit more prescient than I thought it was. Anyway, the game itself is a budget title from 2002 for the PS1, so I barely need to tell you that it's very bad indeed. The most comically bad thing is Santa's basic attack. He hopelessly swings his sack around while walking backwards, barely in control of himself. Santa also has powerful snowballs at his disposal, as well as all the apples that have presumably been left for him by children. Sadly, there isn't a special power-up where Santa goes pure psycho mantis on Brandy, punching everything in sight. That's a missed opportunity. You collect various fins in order to open doors and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's something like that really, that's all it is. The game is barely controllable and little to nothing about it works as it should. It might be the cheapest feeling PS1 game I've ever played, which is saying quite a lot. Is it the worst though? <laughs> Probably not. 
there's not much else to say. I could go on a big rant about how this game is poo bum wankety phlegm in order to fill some time, but you'll know my heart wouldn't be into it. Santa Claus Saves the Earth a classically rubbish bit of snow shovelware that's probably rare as hell, but it'll still only cost you a couple of quid if you actually manage to find it. Right, so, we're here. The number one Kim Justice video of 2016. But before that, I just have uh, something to say. Um, 2016 has been, um... Well, while it's not exactly been a good year events-wise, it has been a pretty good year for me personally. This was the year where I finally thought, you know, I can actually take YouTube full time, take it properly out on the road 24-7. And so I did that, and it's going pretty well so far. And for that I just have to thank, well, so many people, pretty much everyone really. I have to thank um, the commenters who actually leave good comments and make this channel feel like something of a community. The lurkers, the patrons, my fellow YouTuber comrades, everyone on Twitter, everyone on Facebook, just big massive one massive great hug to every single one of you because all of you do your little bit to make this channel what it is and I'm so happy for that and so glad to have done all of these videos for you in 2016 and long may it continue just thought I'd throw that out there thank you all so much and now without any further delving into mawkishness it's in the end, there was basically zero doubt. The rise and fall of Peter Molyneux smashed every other video. This four-part series received 189 votes, or 33% of the total vote. That's pretty freaking decisive. This series, jeez. It originally started out as a single lengthy video, but it just got bigger and bigger. It became a monster, evolving into four entire parts. For nearly two months, Peter Molyneux pretty much took over, directing everything. I ate Molyneux, slept Molyneux, breathed Molyneux. I could have almost become Peter Molyneux just through what I was playing and all the videos I was watching. It was pretty outrageous, really. It was a difficult video to do at times, as things can often be when you're covering someone who you admire in many ways and detest in others. But nothing was left out. In the end, as long as it was, it was impossible to leave anything out. It was all essential. I do look back wondering how I managed it, but... Well, it's there now, and I'm not surprised that it was your favourite of the year. I wanted to do Molyneux in some form or another right from the beginning, and in 2016, I managed it. If I'd just released this and nothing else, it'd have still been a pretty decent year. I had absolutely no idea who Peter Molyneux was. I played Theme Park, um but we got a four episode saga about him. And saga makes it sound horrible, it's not a saga. But he is a very interesting and occasionally horrible man, mm. but utterly bizarre and just an amazing character. And Kim does a really amazing job of creating this character, even though he's a real person, I can't quite... No, it's staggering, it's staggering. How is that dude real? It's mad. What an unusual looking camera. For me, it's like kind of going back alone with me and a friend. All of a sudden, you go from doing this friend. I had an idea. I smoked a lot of cigarettes and ate a lot of pizzas and drunk a lot of coke. And, you know, it was just an amazing experience. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it changed everything. Far better than I did, but... There's not much more I could really say about Peter Molyu than what Kim said, really. But I can say this. Of all the big games developers who go around promising people that deliver these incredible games and disappointing millions every single time, he is undoubtedly the most bald. And that just about wraps it up. I mean, not just for this video, but for Kim Justice. Well, in 2016 anyway, I mean Kim Justice in 2017 is an entirely different matter. But um, it's been really fun to finally do a Christmas special at last. It's certainly been more fun than I'd have previously given it credit for, and thank you all for watching. Now I'm sure there's two words that I really need to say at this point, but um, they've just gone, I just can't remember them at the moment, I just, it blank. <sighs> oh yeah, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, you slimy fertilers! Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody!
Have a very Merry Christmas. Now naff off. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry fucking Christmas, you twat. Let's go work back now and enjoy those ad breaks in the world. I've never heard this song before. It sounds like a George Michael song. Rick Mail. You can't have enough Rick Mail. You can't. Or Limmy. No. Quite right. Sorry. See, all this is British stuff, and I'm the only American. Oh, this was a great video, Kim, but uh, oh, I've got that wrong, have Hang on. Of all the games developers that go around promising that they do the f oh fuck, I can't see this thing. It's too zoomed out. Fuck. I don't know what was going on. I, I was a massive Rick Mail fan, even as a yeah. kid. How did I not know? I, I don't get it. How yeah. did I miss those? They were brilliant. That's all you're getting. Oh, I'll give you one more go. I'll give you one more go. I foisted upon her one of the worst shows of all time, and that was Man O' Man by Chris Tarrant. <laughs> In spite of that, we have another second game to show for the fucking hell. Fuck that up. But I can say this, of all the big things to... Oh, fuck off. When I met you on a rainy Tuesday, invited you... Kiss my cheek and snuggle up close to me Cause sugar honey I love you We're not talking to Kim, we're talking to the fictional producer, right? <clears throat> hold my hand, hold my hand, ho 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 hold my And I, I owe it to Kim, this is the one I've known about otherwise Simply a genius mm -hmm. That was such a great idea <laughs> I just hope it doesn't come back to bite me in the ass Hold my hand very tightly, very tightly, very tightly. Hold my hand very tightly. Ooh.